Welcome to the Global Justice Report, an online production of the Center for Global Justice. I'm Cliff Durand, your host for today's program. The Center for Global Justice, El Centro para la Justicia Global, is a multinational and bilingual research center located in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. The center is devoted to research and learning for a better world and empowering a solidarity economy. Due to the pandemic, we've dis discontinued our in-person events and instituted these online seminars or webinars. Without our previous revenue generating programs, we now depend on your donations to support these webinars and to be able to continue to pay our Mexican staff. You can donate at our website, www.globaljusticecenter.org. Today's program is the 32nd webinar since we started them on June 1. Let me take a moment to uh, preview our upcoming event uh, next, um, next Monday, a week from today. We will be uh, doing a webinar on um, the commons, expanding the commons and democratizing public goods, featuring um, Dario Azzolini, a sociologist, and Nancy Holmstrom, a philosopher. So I hope you'll join us then for what will be our last program of this calendar year. We're going to take a break for the holidays after next Monday, but we'll be back in January, starting on January 4th with a webinar, Combating Racism which is a good way to start off the new year, I think. Well, today is December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. It's the anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941, an event that launched the United States into World War II and onto the world stage. Now, eight decades later, we can look at the myths that have surrounded that war. They are important to examine critically today because they contribute to our present crisis. Our topic today is those dangerous myths surrounding World War II and how they have contributed to the existential crises facing humanity today demonstrating the importance of understanding history. We are indeed fortunate today to have as our speaker, Peter Kuznick, a historian at American University in Washington, DC, and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute there. He um, is known as a critic of President Truman's decision to drop the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and, uh, has, but has a history of activism and the civil rights and anti-Vietnam War movements of uh, the 1960s. Uh, and um, active in uh, uh, the issue of nuclear abolition. To most of our viewers, the name Peter Kuznick probably rings a bell because of his collaboration with Oliver Stone. Um, the um, documentary series, The Untold History of the United States. Uh, which uh, was also published as a book. And if you see him uh, on your screen, you'll see behind him a copy of the book propped up on his bookshelf. So we're really fortunate to have you with us, Peter, today and looking forward 
to uh, to hearing about those myths that often litter so much of history. The floor is yours. Thank you, Cliff. <clears throat> it's especially nice to be with you on the 79th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Uh, one of the myths, so we would deal with World War II. We've got some problems. First is that people know very little of the history of World War II. And the second is that much of what they know is wrong. Even Pearl Harbor, we think we know what happened in Pearl Harbor. I'm not gonna go into the whole history, but what people don't realize is that on that day, Japan also attacked Hong Kong, Malaya, the Philippines, Guam, Wake Island, and Midway Island. In fact, the attack on Malaya actually preceded the attack on Pearl Harbor. So this was part of a much broader policy that, uh, or a strategy that the Japanese were embarking on in late 1941. Not planning to get into that, that and then the question of whether or not Roosevelt knew that the attack was coming and deliberately let it happen. Because uh, there are some other myths that I think are more essential for us to look at today. And I wanna focus primarily on three. The first is that uh, the United States won the war in Europe. The second is that the atomic bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not only militarily necessary, morally justifiable, but that they actually ended World War II. And the third is that the Cold War began during World War II because of Soviet aggression and Soviet desire for territorial aggrandizement. Those are the myths that are the heart of the mess that we find ourselves in today. And we look at this global situation and we just had a big election in the United States. <clears throat> And I was pleased with the outcome. I was at least pleased that Donald Trump was defeated. I was pleased that the Republican Party was impartially defeated. But we're in a, day, a precarious situation. According to the Bulletin Atomic Scientist, in January of 2018, they moved the hands of the doomsday clock to two minutes before midnight. The closest it had ever been since the new, the Doomsday clock was begun in 1947. The only time they moved it to two minutes before midnight was after the US and the Soviets tested their hydrogen bombs in 1952 and 1953. From there, it got worse. Then the US decided and Mattis announced that America's national security threats were primarily Russia and China, no longer the war on terror uh, and, and international terrorism. Then in February of 2018, Trump issued his new nuclear posture review, which called for developing new nuclear weapons and lowering the threshold for their use. Then March 1st, 2018, Putin issues his State of the Nation address and announces that Russia has now developed five new nuclear weapons, all of which could circumvent US missile defense that they'd begun this back in 2002, 2003, when the US pulled out of the ABM treaty. And now these weapons were coming into fruition. Then earlier this year, they moved the hands, the bullet atomic scientists moved the hands of the doomsday clock to 100 seconds before midnight, the closest it's ever been. Trump's statements, policies, strategies were very, very dangerous in this regard. Uh, is he said, we don't fear a nuclear arms race. We welcome one, we're gonna win it. Marshall Billingsley, his arms control negotiator said the same thing, bring it on, we want a nuclear arms race. Uh, and we were going in that direction. Trump abrogated almost all of our nuclear treaties, starting with the uh, JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal he pulled out of. He pulled out of the intermediate range nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF Treaty, pulled out of the Open Skies Treaty, uh, and then announced that he wasn't gonna uh, renew uh, and extend the New START Treaty. The New START Treaty was the last part of the arms control architecture that was left. 
It expires on February 5th, 2021. Putin had called from the very beginning for extending the New START Treaty. In that first phone conversation he had with Trump, he said, we should extend the New START Treaty. Trump said, hold on a second. He puts down the phone and he asks the advisor in the room, what's the New START Treaty? They tell him, he says, well, I don't like that. He gets back on and he tells Putin, well, we're not gonna extend that. Uh, and so if that goes, then we are really back in that nuclear arms race. And in the 19, I, I take students every summer to Hiroshima and Nagasaki in a study abroad class. I've been doing this since 1995. And year after year in the Atomic Bomb Museum in Hiroshima, I find myself writing down the same, same data that by 1985, the world had accumulated the equivalent of 1.47 million Hiroshima bombs, 70,000 nuclear weapons. We actually got up to 1.6 million Hiroshima bombs in destructive capability. That's the insanity that we're looking at now. The US is involved in this 30 year nuclear modernization program, now estimated to cost $1.7 trillion, begun by Obama. And all eight other nuclear nations are also modernizing their weapon systems, their delivery systems, as well as their bombs to make them more lethal, more efficient. So that's what we're up against, a time of insanity. And then you've got the Republican party which is no longer a Republican party. It's a fascist death cult at this point. How many deaths now? 283,000 in the United States from coronavirus alone. Uh, and the danger is for me that you've got the head of this party, a man who's totally delusional, who's lost all sense of reality. He never had a great sense of reality being the kind of pathological narcissist and liar that he is. But now he's even more unhinged than before. And this is a man who's got his access to the nuclear codes, who's replaced three of the four top people in the Pentagon uh, who might have stood up to him, like Esper might have stood up to him if he gave some insane order, who's trying to provoke a war with Iran at this very moment. And, and so we're in a very precarious situation for the next 45 days. And then we got the Biden administration coming in and, by, and, and if we look at who Biden's foreign policy advisors are, they're not unhinged and dangerous in quite the way that Trump's people are. But these people brought us every war that we've want, looked at for the past two decades. So these were the cheerleaders for Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Syria, putting more troops in Syria, bombing in Syria, the developments in Ukraine. So even though they're not the Trump people, they're dangerous in their own way. So we got a lot to deal with. What I wanna to do today is not so much talk about this, although we can do this in the question and answer period and look more closely at who Biden's advisors are and what their positions are on these issues. But I wanna talk about the roots of a lot of this. And what Oliver Stone and I do in Untold History, if we trace the roots of the American empire and national security state back to the 1890s. What I'm gonna to do today in honor of Pearl Harbor is talk about World War II and the fundamental myths of World War II. And the one I began with is this idea that the United States won the war in Europe, which is believed by most people around the world, including in Europe. What we know in Europe is that 14% or 13% of Europeans think that the Soviet army made a major contribution to the defeat of fascism. In France, it's only 7%. Although after World War II, over, the majority of French gave the, gave the main credit to the Soviets for defeating the Nazis. Now it's down to 7% of France. In the United States, the same thing, where the overwhelming majority think that the United States won the war in Europe. And it's a very, very dangerous myth uh, and the ignorance on this runs very, very deep in the United States. Uh, and, and we look at the American versus the Russian perception. I've taken students to Russia for Victory Day. I couldn't do it last year because of the coronavirus. But for three, the three years before that, I was able to do that. And the Russians are very proud of what they accomplished in World War II. If we look at the 20th century, and probably the defeat of fascism is the major accomplishment that they had in the 20th century. Uh, 
and, and, and they're very, very angry and resentful about the Western attitude that they don't deserve the credit for it. And you look at the US versus the Russian perception, even the chronology is different. For the Americans, the war begins on December 7th, 1941. For the Russians, the war begins on June 22nd, 1941, when the Germans invade. The uh, Russian narrative then deals with the Battle of Stalingrad from August 23rd, 1942 to February 2nd, 1943, when they are able to defeat the Nazi army. Uh, it even begins earlier when they're able to resist that first incursion against Moscow. But the Battle of Leningrad doesn't end until January 27th of 1944, after an, a siege that lasted 872 days with massive starvation and massive resistance. The American narrative, so we begin on, on uh, D-Day uh, with the attack of Pearl Harbor. Uh, and then three days later, uh, Germany and Italy declare war against the United States. So first the United States declares war against Japan, then Germany and Italy declare war against the United States. And then uh, the, but then the fighting doesn't really begin. For the United States, uh, then we have this incursion in Northern Africa. Uh, and then the real story for the United States begins uh, begins uh, with D-Day on, on uh, June 6, 1944. So Pearl Harbor, uh, 1941 to D-Day, June 6, 1944. Then the Americans storm the beaches very bravely, triumph, uh, get through the barricades and the machine guns and march to Berlin and win the war. That is... Uh, so far from the reality of World War II, that it's important that we take a look at that. Uh, the reality of the war is that throughout most of the war, the United States and the British were facing 10 German divisions between us, while the Soviets were facing more than 200 German divisions. Germany lost 6 million on the Eastern Front, 1 million on the Western Front, uh, it's for that reason that Churchill said that the Red Army tore the guts out of the German war machine. And the, if we look at the actual history, the uh, very important, in May of 1942, President Roosevelt, eager to get the U.S. involved in combat, told asked Stalin to send over Foreign Minister Molotov and a trusted general to Washington. They arrived in late May. At that meeting between them and General Marshall, uh, Roosevelt turns to Marshall and says, can we open up the second front in Western Europe before the end of 1942? And Marshall says, yes. And they issue a, a proclamation then, says the US will be involved in the war in Europe before the end of 1942. The Soviets were ecstatic. That's what they wanted more than anything. They had three demands that they made after the German uh, Blitzkrieg. The Americans were afraid that the Soviets were going to bow out of the war after Germany attacked them. And, uh, but Stalin said, give us armaments so that we can fight. Give us the planes, the materials to make the planes and other armaments, and we will fight this war. Uh, and so Hopkins brings back that information, and, they, and we do that. Although we weren't able to deliver on what we promised them. We got lead and lease through. We we're able to, we promised them a massive amount of, of, of materiel. We couldn't deliver that. Some of it was sabotage and some of it was our war, our war industries were not up to speed yet at that point. They made two other demands. One was they wanted the same territorial borders that they had gotten in the uh, Nazi Soviet Pact of 1939, basically restoring a lot of what they lost in World War I. Uh, the United States did not want to go along with that. We did not want a world that was carved up like after World War I. So the US held off on that. The British were much more open to allowing them the territorial changes that they wanted. But the third thing and the main thing they wanted was the second front because they were doing almost all the fighting and all the dying and they wanted the, the United States and the Europeans to open up a second front so that Germany would have to fight a two front war, take some of the pressure. We promised to do so. However, 
uh, Churchill had gone along with it initially, now announces that the, the British can't go along with this. We don't have the, uh, we don't have the transport to do that. We're not ready to do that. So instead, Churchill convinces Roosevelt to invade North Africa. Roosevelt wanted to get involved somewhere. He knew the United States had to get militarily involved. When he announced that we were going to invade North Africa, his leading generals were furious. Marshall denounced this as periphery pecking and said, we so, he was so angry with the British. He said, let's change the order. Let's go after Japan first and we'll worry about Germany second. Eisenhower, who led the invasion of North Africa, said, when we invade North Africa, this will be the blackest day in, in, world, in American history, was what Eisenhower said. But they understood that the North Africa was important. Yes, it was important to British oil interests in the Middle East, especially. It was important to British colonial interests. It was not the way to end the war as quickly as possible. <clears throat> and the American military leaders were very much aware of that. Uh, and so, uh, but by this point, or later, soon thereafter, the Soviets turned the tide at Stalingrad. They're going to win the at, at, at uh, and they had, they win the big tank battle at Kursk, and they're going to win the battle at Leningrad soon, and they've got the diplomatic upper hand. The tide has turned, and now Hitler says the gods of war have gone over to the other side after the battle at. Uh, at Stalingrad. Uh, so, uh, but so diplomatically things have changed, but also the attitude in the United States toward the Soviet Union is changing during this time. And the American people are seeing the Soviets as heroic, gallant victors who are defeating the fascists. In fact, if you, uh, Orville Scott, who is the principal book reviewer in the New York Times, wrote on June 22nd, 1942, a year after the uh, Germans invaded the Soviet Union. He says, the vast armaments, the fighting skill and magnificent courage of the Red Army may prove to have been the decisive factors in the salvation of the human race from Nazi slavery. He says, our debt of gratitude to the millions of Russian soldiers who have fought and died in this war and who will continue to do so is beyond estimation or expression. That attitude was prevalent at the time. It was widespread, this appreciation of what the Soviets had to do in order to defeat the Germans, move their industry, relocate their industry, and resist this massive onslaught. Uh, what do Americans know about this? Very, very little. I asked college students. I, these are all A students in high school. I asked them, how many Americans died in World War II? The median answer I got was 90,000. Okay, there are only 300,000 off. That's in the ballpark. I asked them how many Soviets died in World War II. The median answer I got was 100,000. There are only 27 million off. They know nothing about World War II. They can understand nothing about the Cold War. They know nothing about what's going on in Ukraine now. They do not know this history. And without knowing this history, this crucial history, then we're lost. And these kids, smart as they are, uh, are, are, are lost in that regard. Uh, what John Kennedy said in his AU commencement address in 1963, June of 63, perhaps the greatest presidential speech of the 20th century, Kennedy said uh, that what the Soviets suffered in World War II was the equivalent of the entire United States east of Chicago being wiped out. Uh, and and the, the, the losses are, are astounding, uh, but, the, uh, re, but the Americans don't know that, don't appreciate that, and believe still that it's the United States that won the war in Europe. The United States contributed significantly, I'm not trying to deny that, but the United States role the United States played compared to the role that the Soviet Red Army played the Soviet people. Stalin uh, was as horrible as Stalin is. I'm not defending anything about him. But as a war leader, uh, as Avril Harriman even said, US ambassador to the Soviet Union, said as a war leader, he was unmatched, far superior to Churchill and to Roosevelt. Now, of course, I would take issue with a lot of that. As a war leader, in many ways, Stalin 
blundered repeatedly, but uh, the Soviet contribution needs to be recognized. As uh, Ralph Parker wrote in the New York Times in April 1942, he says, it would need a Tolstoy to describe the heroic endurance of the men and women who have made these things possible inside the Soviet Union. General MacArthur credited the Red Army with one of the greatest military feats in history. Anyway, there's a lot, lot to that, and we'll get more into that. Um, the second topic I want to discuss, which is equally shrouded in myth and ignorance, is the uh, atomic bombings of World War II. Uh, and, and just look at some of what some of our leaders have, have written recently. In 2019, Susan Rice had an op-ed in the New York Times. I was holding my breath, hoping she does not get appointed to be national security advisor, hoping she did not get appointed to be national defense secretary. Um, and so far, so good. But she wrote, quote, following D-Day, my father was sent to the West Coast to prepare for deployment to the Pacific Theater. He was spared combat by President Harry Truman's decision to drop atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, provoking the Japanese surrender. She's not alone in that. Uh, Chris Wallace of Fox News, the great debate moderator, had a uh, uh, wrote a, wrote a best-selling book, bestseller for months, New York Times, called Countdown 1945, in which Chris Wallace writes, despite all his misgivings, Truman knew he had to drop the atomic bomb. The Manhattan Project had given him a weapon to potentially end the war, and no matter how devastating their losses, the Japanese refused to surrender. They left him no choice. Okay, Chris Wallace, Susan Rice. Well, Susan Rice should know better. Uh, she uh, was at Stanford where Bart Bernstein teaches and Bart Bernstein would have taught her a much more nuanced understanding of the atomic bombing. But maybe Susan Rice's judgment was clouded by the fact that she was a Harry Truman scholar when she was at Stanford. Uh, but then Barack Obama. What did Obama say when he went to Hiroshima in May of 2016? I urged him to go to Hiroshima from the day he was elected. And I applauded the fact that he was going. But, but the, the visit was really disappointing, to put it mildly. But what he says in his speech, after spending a long period of time with the Marines at Iwakuni base and the Japanese self-defense forces, and he finally makes it into Hiroshima, so there was eight minutes in the atomic bomb museum, and then he gives his talk in front of the cenotaph. I was there, Japanese public television brought me over there to do commentary about Obama's visit. Uh, and Obama says, starts the first line, sentence, uh, death fell from the skies in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Death didn't fall from the skies. As my students know, uh, well, you don't, you don't use passive voice in that way. You know, death didn't fall from the skies. The United States dropped two atomic bombs. A big difference, which he doesn't say at any point in his speech. But he goes on and says, World War II reached this brutal end in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The fundamental myth over and over and over again, because if World War II reached this end, then maybe you can justify the atomic bombing. But not only did World War II not reach this end, the Americans knew that the war could be ended without use of the atomic bombs. American intelligence said so repeatedly. And this is the myth, the history that people have so little understanding of. Let me just run through some of the basics. This is a topic on which my students sit through a 12 hour, 12 hours on. And I know we don't have 12 hours today to talk about it. Uh, but uh, so we start, should start in December of 1938, when Hans Strassmann, two German physicists, split the uranium atom for the first time create nuclear fission. Word comes to American scientists at a conference in Washington, D.C. in January of 1939. Uh, and, uh, and very quickly, smart physicists realize this creates the theoretical possibility of developing atomic bombs. 
But the, the American military was not interested. American political leaders were not interested. The ones who were concerned were the emigre scientists who had escaped from Nazi-occupied Europe. And what their fear was that given German knowledge, even despite the purges under Hitler of Jewish science and all of the people who had left, that with a program that, that, the, that the German program uh, and German capabilities meant that Germany could develop atomic bombs. And the emigre scientists were terrified what, what that would mean with atomic bombs in Hitler's hands. So they urged the Americans to begin a nuclear research program, but the Americans were not interested. And so finally, two Hungarian physicists, uh, Leo Zillard especially, uh, gets a car and drives out to Conic Long Island where Albert Einstein was vacationing. This is July 16th, 1939. And Einstein, who was working on the unified field theory, did not even know that the Germans had split the uranium atom, even though it was seven months earlier, eight months earlier that they had done so. But as soon as he realized it, he agrees to sign the letter to President Roosevelt urging the United States to begin the bomb project. Einstein later commented, I made one great mistake in my life, signing a letter urging Roosevelt to begin the bomb project. Actually, Einstein sent three letters to that effect, urging the US to expedite things. So, uh, and the US begins, but very, very slowly. They put it in the soil, soil uranium committee headed by a soil physicist, Lyman Briggs, and it gets, it goes off the ground very, very slowly. It doesn't really begin until early 1942. But we're not gonna go into the history of how we built the bomb uh, but the important thing for us is the question of was the bomb necessary and why did we use it and what was the justification and what do we really know? And the, uh, the assumption was that the United, in order to win the war, the United States was going to have to blockade Japan, bomb Japan, and then invade. So it was a three-pronged strategy for winning the war. Was, that, was the, uh, the invasion actually necessary? And the truth is the invasion was not necessary. After the Battle of Saipan in July of 1944, the Japanese knew they were defeated. The Japanese knew they could not win militarily in any traditional sense. Uh, it, and this, this is reflected in a lot of ways. The Air Force was, was, was almost destroyed and they had very little fuel. The Navy was decimated. The Army was tied down. So then if the Japanese could not, knew they could not win, and, and it's in February of 1945 that Prince Kanoe, the three-time former prime minister, writes to the emperor and says, I regret to inform you but uh, defeat is inevitable. That was February of 1945. He writes to the emperor, I regret to inform you, but defeat is inevitable. And he goes on to say that what we have to uh, safeguard against is a communist uprising when, the, you, when we surrender. That was their big concern, especially Kanoe's big concern. Uh, and the situation worsens from there on out. So the United States begins its real bombing attack on the night of March 9th, 1945. Uh, LeMay replaces the former general who did not, uh, who did not want to bomb Japanese civilians, in Japanese cities, wanted to limit it to, to military targets, uh, but LeMay has no such compunctions and the United States bombs uh, Tokyo the night of March 9th and March 10th, killing almost 100,000 people. From there on, the United States goes, goes on to bomb more than 100 Japanese cities. Destruction, and, and the kind of bombing we were using were incendiary bombs. The goal was to create firestorms and the destruction in the city of Toyama reached 99.5%, 99.5% destruction in the city of Toyama. Uh, we write about, I write about this, so the city, the city government in Toyama invited Oliver Stone and me to come speak there a couple of years ago. And then they started a World War II museum uh, during, during our visit there. Uh, but, uh, but so the United States was bombing all these cities. To the Japanese leaders, they accepted that the United States could wipe out their cities. 
They accepted that we could firebomb and wipe out their cities. And that was happening throughout the rest of the war through the summer of 1945. We were going after the secondary and tertiary cities that have very little military significance whatsoever. So, uh, but the, the question, would the United States have had to invade? And the answer is no, By, uh, because there were two other ways the United States could end the war without an invasion. The first was to change the surrender terms. At Casablanca, Roosevelt announces that the US is gonna seek the unconditional surrender of Germany and Japan. What does unconditional surrender mean? Unconditional surrender to Japan means that the, uh, that the emperor would be tried as a war criminal and likely executed. That was how the Japanese considered it. To the Japanese, the emperor was a deity. In fact, General MacArthur uh, in his background report of his Southwest Pacific Command in the summer of 1945 says, the execution of the emperor to us would be like the crucifixion, the, emperor, the execution of the emperor to them would be like the crucifixion of Christ to us. All would fight to die like ants. All of Truman's advisors urged him to change the surrender terms to let them Japanese know that they could keep the emperor. In fact, according to Secretary of War Stimson, it was in our interest to do so. Without that, there is no guarantee we could get the Japanese to surrender or the Japanese military around the world would be willing to accept that. And so that was gonna be crucial from the American standpoint. <laughs> and almost all, of, really every major advisor of Truman's urged him to change the surrender terms, except for one. Now, before I get into that, let me backtrack a tiny bit because there's an important political development that occurs in April 1945 that people, or actually, let me go back a little bit earlier to 1944, to the Democratic Party Convention. Most Americans now do not remember the name Henry Wallace. Henry Wallace uh, was Roosevelt's vice president from 1941 to 1945. Roosevelt, knowing that we were about to enter a war against fascism, German fascism, Japanese militarism, wanted a leading anti-fascist on the ticket as vice president. And he chose Henry Wallace. Wallace had been his secretary of agriculture for two terms. He, he and Harold Ickes were the leading progressives in the New Deal administration. And, but in 1940, when Roosevelt wanted Wallace on the ticket, the party bosses refused to put Wallace on the ticket. Roosevelt wrote a remarkable letter to the Democratic Party convention, turning down the nomination. He says, we already have one Wall Street dominated conservative party in the United States, the Republican party. If the Democrats are, gonna, are not gonna stand for true progressive policies and social justice, then the Democrats have no reason to exist. And I'm not gonna run as the president on that ticket. And he wrote a letter to the convention to turn it down. Eleanor Roosevelt went to the floor of the convention for the first time that a first lady did so and told him that he's serious, he's gonna not run for president. And they put Wallace begrudgingly on the ticket. The party bosses were furious. And partly because Wallace had a reputation for being ra very, very radical in his views. As vice president, uh, Wallace uh, was, uh, created quite a ruckus also. In 1941, Henry Luce wrote, his, the head of the Time Life Empire, wrote his editorial saying that the 20th century must be the American century. The United States will dominate the world economically, militarily, financially, uh, politically, in all ways, culturally. R Wallace as vice president responded and he said, no, the 20th century must become the century of the common man. He called for a worldwide people's revolution in the tradition of the American revolution, the French revolution, the Latin American revolutions, the German revolution of 1848 and the Russian revolution. And he called for worldwide full employment, a worldwide new deal, spreading the fruits of science and technology around the world, ending colonialism and imperialism, ending economic exploitation around the world. 
he had enemies. His enemies included the British and the French because he was the leading critic of British and French colonialism. His enemies included the Southern segregationists. He was the leading proponent of ending segregation and supporting civil rights in the Democratic Party. His enemies included the sexists and misogynists. He was the leading defender of women's rights. Yeah, it, it, I mean, we can go, there's Wall Street. He denounced Wall Street. He says, he denounced America's fascists. He said, America's fascists are those who think that Wall Street comes first and the American people second. Wall Street hated him. He, was the, he had the support of the labor movement. He was the leading, leading supporter of labor. And so in 1944, the party bosses and the conservatives wanted to get him off the ticket. And they staged what was called Pauli's coup named after the corrupt Democratic Party treasurer from California, Edwin Pauley, who said that I went into politics when I realized it was cheaper to elect a new Congress than to buy up the old one. And so, uh, and he runs what he calls Pauley's coup to get Wallace off the ticket. The Democratic Party convention began July 20th, 1944 in Chicago. On the night that the, that, that the convention began, Gallup released a poll asking potential voters who they wanted on the ticket as vice president. 65% said they wanted Wallace back as vice president. 2% said they wanted Harry Truman on the ticket as vice president. Well, good old American democracy. It's not only Donald Trump's America that's corrupt. It was 1944 America also. But Wallace made the seconding speech at the convention for Roosevelt. And then there was a spontaneous demonstration on the floor led by, among others, Adlai Stevenson and Hubert Humphrey, uh, a pro-Wallace demonstration that went on for almost an hour, in the middle of which Claude Pepper, the senator from Florida, then known as Claude Red Pepper, uh, realizes that if he could get to the, to the uh, podium and put Wallace's name in nomination, they'll defy the bosses and Wallace will sweep the convention. And so he fights his way to the front. The party bosses led by Mayor Kelly of Chicago see what's happening and they start screaming to adjourn the meeting. Uh, they say it's a fire hazard, adjourn immediately. Sam Jackson is chairing the convention, says I have a motion to adjourn. All in favor say aye. About 5% said aye. All opposed say nay. Everybody else shouts out nay. He says motion carried, meeting adjourned. Pepper at that point was five feet from the, from the podium five feet from the microphone. Had he gotten those five feet to the microphone and nominated Wallace that night, Wallace would have been back on the ticket as vice president. He would have become president on April 12th, 1945, when Roosevelt died and not Harry Truman. There would have been no atomic bombings in World War II and probably no Cold War. And all of history would have been very, very different. Unfortunately, Harry Truman Gets, uh, gets the nomination and on the third, third ballot. And then finally the deals kick in and Truman, Truman wins after Wallace had been way ahead in the first ballot. And so <clears throat> Truman gets in there and as vice president, Truman was in uh, vice president office for 82 days, during which time he spoke to Roosevelt twice about nothing of substance. He knew nothing about our, our differences with the British he knew nothing about our agreements with the Russians. Uh, and in fact, people had so little regard for Truman. I don't have time to go into his background, but we can in questions. But they had so little regard for Truman that nobody even bothered to tell him we were building an atomic bomb. In fact, he doesn't find out we're building an atomic bomb until after he's sworn in on the night of April 12th. And it's the next day that Jimmy Burns flies up from Spartanburg, South Carolina in Secretary of the Navy Forrestal's private plane. And he's the one who gives Truman the real briefing on this. And, and it's interesting when it says is important because Truman writes in his memoirs, says uh, that Burns told me that this is a weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. Not a more powerful bomb, but the weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. Those were Truman's own words. We'll get back to that because that's important. But Burns, who wanted to be the pr real president, uh, me, Truman says to him there, tell me everything. I don't know anything about what's going on in the world. And you were at Yalta, you know what's going on. So, uh, so Burns does so, he has very little respect for Truman. 
and decides he's going to take over, basically. Truman says there, I, you, you have to advise me from behind the scenes because Statinius has got to finish the negotiations for the United Nations, and then I'll make you my Secretary of State. And Burns becomes Secretary of State on July 3rd, 1945, and it, and it accompanies Truman to Potsdam. And Burns is the one who keeps telling him, don't change the surrender terms because you'll be politically crucified by the American people. He was the only major advisor who said that. The military people want them to change the rather terms, people in the State Department, all his advisors, but Truman resisted and refused to do so. Uh, the second way to end the war without use of the atomic bombs was to wait for the Soviet invasion. From the day after Pearl Harbor, the United States had been imploring the Soviet Union to come into the Pacific War on our side. But Stalin had to fight a war in Europe. Finally, at Yalta in February 1945, Stalin tells Roosevelt he agrees to come into the Pacific War three months after the end of the war in Europe, three months after the end of the war in Europe, uh, which would make it right around August 8th, August 9th. Uh, what, is, what does that mean? U.S. intelligence, at least since April, had reported several times that Soviet entry into the war will convince all Japanese that further resistance is futile. Soviet entry into the war will end the war. American intelligence the intelligence staff to the Joint Chiefs of Staff meeting in Potsdam and before that uh, uh, repeated this. And we get this also, and the reason why we know what's going on so well is because the United States had broken the Japanese codes and we were intercepting their telegrams. And in mid-May, the Japanese War Council decided that their best strategy for holding out was to appeal to the Soviet Union to stay out of the war and get them better surrender terms. And so we intercepted the cables going from Foreign Minister Togo in Tokyo to, to the ambassador in, uh, in Moscow. It goes back and forth um, from Togo to Sato. And the, the cables say, as it, one of them says explicitly, the only obstacle to peace is the demand for unconditional surrender. The Japanese said that repeatedly. If they let us keep, uh, keep the emperor and the honor of Japan, we can end the war tomorrow. Uh, and the, uh, so the foreign minister, uh, former Japanese foreign minister met with the Soviet ambassador in Tokyo, Ambassador Malik, and Hirota meets with Malik in early June several times. And Malik writes back to the Kremlin, the Japanese are desperate to surrender. The Japanese want to surrender, they're desperate to surrender, which Stalin informs Truman of when they meet at Potsdam. So we put this all together. Uh, the Japanese and they, their statements are that, the, that Soviet entry into the war will deal a death blow to the Japanese empire. American intelligence says the same thing. What does Harry Truman understand? Truman goes to, uh, to Potsdam and has lunch with Stalin on July 17th. Afterwards, uh, Truman writes in his diary, Stalin will be in the Jap war by August 15th. Finny Japs when that comes about. He writes home to his wife, Bess, the next day and says the Russians are coming in, we'll end the war a year sooner now. Think of all the kids who won't be killed. Truman refers to the intercepted July 18th telegram as the telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. Those are Truman's words. The telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. Truman and all those around him, when they saw the cables going back and forth from Tokyo to Moscow and back, all knew that the Japanese were desperate to surrender. They knew that the atomic bomb was not necessary. But the, but, and they also knew that if Stalin signed the Potsdam Proclamation, that would signal to the Japanese that the Russians were about to come into the war, that would also speed up the Japanese surrender. But the United States does not disclose any of this uh, because the United States wants to use the bomb. 
And we want to use the bomb, not just to end the war against Japan, which was not necessary, not just to prevent an invasion, which was not necessary, but also to send a message to the Soviet Union <clears throat> that the Soviets interfere with America's plans in Europe or in the Pacific, that they're going to get this and worse. And that's exactly how the Soviets interpreted the atomic bombing. The Soviets, because the Soviets knew the Japanese were desperate to surrender, the Soviets saw this as an example of the most vicious kind of ruthlessness on the American part, that the Americans would not be constrained by any morality, any decency, uh, if in, in terms of being sure that they get their way in the post-war world. Uh, and that was the exact response by Stalin, by the people around him in the Kremlin. I could go through some of the... Uh, uh, quote to you the comments that they made, but that was the response that the, that the United States is now trying to reverse the Soviet victory in Europe and in the Pacific. And so the Soviet invasion begins on midnight on August 8th. The Red Army blows through the Kwantung Army, 700,000 strong in Manchuria. Uh, and what Prime Minister Suzuki was asked on uh, July, uh, asked why the Japanese why, why the Japanese had to surrender so quickly, and I could try to find this for you because it's worth uh, quoting. He says on on August thirteenth, uh, why he can't delay. He says I can't do that. If we miss today, the Soviet Union will take not only Manchuria, Korea, Karafuto, but also Hokkaido. This would destroy the foundation of Japan. We must end the war we can deal with the US. The Japanese leaders who were asked by the US interrogators why the Japanese had to surrender or why the Japanese surrendered, say, according to General Kawabe, Admiral Toyota and others, the Soviet invasion changed everything. Because up to that point, the Japanese had their Ketsu Go strategy. And their strategy was to wait for an American invasion, inflict such heavy casualties on the Americans that the Americans would give them better surrender terms. But once the Soviets invaded, the game was up and they realized that. Uh, and so that's what forced the Japanese surrender uh, because the Japanese accepted th that the Americans could wipe out their cities. As terrible as Hiroshima and Nagasaki were, to the Japanese leaders, it was just two more cities that they were willing to sacrifice. But the Soviet invasion changed the war. Uh, now they'd fight a two front war. Now they, they, the Red Army that they feared and they discussed repeatedly in their cabinet meetings, the Red Army had come in and now they had to face that. And so, uh, but so these myths about the atomic bomb ending the war, that's not what ended the war. The atomic bomb did not end the war. The Soviet invasion ended the war as American intelligence have been saying it would, as Truman said it would, as the Americans recognized it would, as the, uh, the Japanese themselves recognized it would. But this myth there, which preserves America's decency, this idea, you know, and, and if we look at the attitude among American military leaders, uh, this is important, worth digging up here in my notes, uh, American military leaders, the United States had eight five-star admirals and generals in 1945. Eight five-star admirals and generals. Seven of the eight are on record saying the atomic bombings were militarily unnecessary, morally reprehensible, or both. This includes, well, the, most, the strongest statement was by Admiral Leahy. Admiral Leahy was Truman's personal chief of staff. He chaired the meetings of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Leahy said, uh, the Japanese were defeated and ready to surrender. The use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. It being the first to use it, we adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. Uh, but we, similar, uh, Eisenhower. When Eisenhower was told by Stimson at Potsdam that the US was about to use the bomb, Eisenhower says, I got more and more depressed. 
then he asked me for my opinion. He said, I didn't say anything because my war in Europe was over. He asked me for my opinion. I told him I was against it on two counts. First, the Japanese were defeated and ready to surrender. There was no use, need for that weapon. And second, I hated to see our country be the first to introduce it. General MacArthur, who wanted to use atomic bombs during the Korean War, was certainly no pacifist, but MacArthur got very depressed when he found out. And he later wrote to former President Hoover. Hoover had sent a memo in May of 1945 urging the American government to change the surrender terms. And uh, MacArthur writes to Hoover and says, your wise memo, if we had adopted it, we could have ended the war as early as May. He said the Japanese would have accepted it, would have surrendered and happily done so as early as May, saved American lives, saved Japanese lives, obviated the use of the bomb. We could go on and on. Uh, but along those lines, I mean, there's so much to be said, but uh, American, we go to the US Navy Museum here in Washington, DC. Even the official museum of the US Navy now says, the vast destruction wreaked by the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the loss of 135,000 people made little impact on the Japanese military. However, the Soviet invasion of Manchuria changed their minds. That's the official museum of the US Navy. The more impo most important point to make, and I know I'm going on a little long here, but the most important point to make and the real condemnation of Truman and, and those who supported the use of the bomb, including Leslie Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project, was that they understood they were beginning a process that could end all life on the planet. And they used it in the way that was most dangerous and most reckless. And we've lived with that legacy ever since. Truman writes, as I mentioned uh, in his journal, uh, in his memoirs, that first day when, uh, when Burns briefs him, that Burns said this was uh, that, uh, a weapon that could end, end the world, destroy the world. Truman gets a full briefing on the bomb on April 25th from Secretary of War Stimson and Leslie Groves. And after which he writes, uh, basically, I'll just paraphrase. Uh, Stimson said that this weapon was so powerful that maybe that, that if we use it, it could destroy the world. Maybe we should consider not using it, even if we have it. And Truman says, I agreed with him that this is too terrible a weapon. But when Truman is at Potsdam on July 25th, he gets word of how powerful the bomb test at Alamogordo, New Mexico was. And Truman writes in his, in his journal that night, we've discovered the most terrible weapon in history. This may be the fire destruction prophesied in the Euphrates Valley era after Noah and his fabulous ark. And by using it in the way that he did and was warned by the scientists or the scientists wrote uh, that um, we should not use the atomic bomb because if we use it in a military way against Japan, it's gonna to lead to an uncontrollable arms race that could be disaster and doom for everybody. That would, anybody who understood this at the time knew that we were beginning that process. And in fact, um, Robert Oppenheimer, the head of the scientific head of the Manhattan Project, briefed the members of the interim committee, which was the committee that was set up to make the decisions about the bomb Bob's use on May 31st, 1945, Oppenheimer briefs the members of the interim committee and says that this is the military leaders and the political leaders that within three years, we're likely to have weapons between 700 and 7,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. We went into this with our eyes wide open. We knew the world we were creating, the insanity, and in Project Sundial, you think of the insanity, in Project Sundial in 1954, US scientific leaders were testifying to Congress about the possibility of developing a single nuclear weapon that will be 700,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. This is the insanity that we were unleashing with the uh, atomic bombings in 1945. Um, so, well, so uh, I guess I've got one more topic that, but I, I, in fact, I'll just I'll just mention it briefly, and that was that um, 
the third topic about the Cold War beginning in World War II because of Soviet aggression. Roosevelt felt very strongly that if he were in there, there would be no Cold War, no, that he and the Soviets were going to get along fine. Uh, after, his, uh, after he has that meeting with Molotov in May, late May 1942, he says also at that meeting that what we need after the war is four policemen. He says the United States, the Soviet Union, the British and the Chinese should be the world's four policemen. We should guarantee the stability, security and peace of the post-war world. Well, maybe that wouldn't be such a smart idea, uh, but he later develops that into his idea for the United Nations. Uh, but the Roosevelt's last telegram before he dies to Churchill says, and I'll paraphrase, that these issues between us and the Soviets come up all the time and they seem to all get resolved. He said, we should not make a big deal about that. The, the uh, Wallace's attitude was the same. Wallace actually stayed on in the cabinet after Truman became vice president. Roosevelt begged him to stay on and Wallace stayed on as secretary of commerce <clears throat> for another year and a half from which position he wages a war against the nuclear arms race and the developing Cold War from inside the cabinet. It was his ouster in September of 1946 that gives the final death knell to the prospects for peace and collaboration and cooperation with the Soviet Union going forward at that point. And we could talk about some of this history. Again, it's something that I write about and that I go on at great length, but the Cold War was not in any sense, inevitable. It was a series of decisions made, especially by the United States, which held the cards. Uh, when Stalin wanted to maintain friendly relations for a number of reasons. One was his country had been destroyed. His goal was to rebuild the Soviet Union. Secondly, in order to do that, he needed the, the $10 billion in reparations that Roosevelt had been dangling. Roosevelt has said, we're going to call, have $20 billion in reparations, half of which will go to the Soviet Union. Uh, and he desperately needed that and wanted that. And he wanted peace because he had a big job to do to rebuild the Soviet Union. And the Cold War does not begin overnight. It's not until 1947. What, what initially, what Stalin wanted was friendly governments. He did not want lockstep governments. He did not want proto-Soviet republics. He did not want Iron Curtain type governments there. And that doesn't begin to develop really till late 46, 1947. There wasn't the kind of democracy that we might like to see in Eastern Europe, but there were elections. There were basically free elections. They installed governments that were friendly to the Soviets, but were not lockstep Soviet style dictatorships like we're going to see later. That happens in 1947, really, and that, that, when that begins. And it's a response to American policy in Germany, Poland, Eastern Europe, uh, the Rose, uh, Truman's, excuse me, Churchill's Iron Curtain speech uh, is a very, very crucial development that Wallace and Eleanor Roosevelt and everybody else denounced, or a lot of other people denounced at the time, and Truman lied about. Uh, so there's a lot of other things we can get into in discussing this part of the history, but I guess I've gone on for uh, an hour. So <clears throat> let, let me stop it there and open it up for discussion. So, so what I'm saying basically, just to conclude, is that so much of the problems we face in the world today are rooted in World War II at a time when we could have developed a very different world, when we had that potential. We just won a victory over fascism there were progressive forces afoot in the United States and other parts of the world. Uh, we could have rebuilt the world in a different way. We could have developed bonds of friendship and alliance and coalition rather than the hostilities that developed. We did not need the nuclear arms race. Eisenhower among one was uh, wanted to turn all America's nuclear weapons over to the United Nations to be destroyd there And then with the Atchison Lilienthal plan that, that was devised by Oppenheimer. We had proposals for preventing a nuclear arms race from developing, but that was not the road we took. And now we're facing, as the bullying atomic scientist says, 
the hands of the doomsday clock at 100 seconds before midnight, the most dangerous relations between the US and Russia and the US and China that we've seen in decades, a world in which the richest eight people have more wealth than the poorest 3.8 billion people living in a country in the United States, which the richest free people have more wealth than the bottom half of the population and which 283,000 people have already died of coronavirus, which we've got an empire of 800 bases around the world, this kind of insanity, and it's not getting better anytime soon, uh, unfortunately. Anyway, thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Peter, for that um, whirlwind tour through some really uh, decisive uh, episodes in history. Um, I'm sure that there are questions and comments, and um, let me tell you how we will handle these. Um, there are some people who are watching this on YouTube, and uh, if you have a question or comment, you can get them to us by emailing them to global.justice.cliff at gmail.com. Just put um, the word question in the subject line so that I can spot them and I will pass your questions on uh, to our speaker. Others of you are in this Zoom room uh, along with the speaker and can ask your questions directly. Uh, and to do that, uh, you just, I'll, I'll put this on uh, gallery view so I can see everybody. And if you have a question or comment, just wave at me and uh, I'll call on you. Uh, make sure you have to turn your camera on too so I can see you wave. Um, so who has an initial question or comment to offer? Okay. Um, Marketkin. Yeah, uh, hi, I'm in Winnipeg. Um, that was fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was, you know, I knew a little bit about most of these topics, but, um, but your, your detail about them is great and a wonderful story. I love listening to you. So I was going to ask about, I was wondering if you would talk about another uh, consideration that I think of as a myth, which is the reasons for the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> and uh, you didn't talk about that. And I'm wondering if you don't talk about it because uh, uh, because it doesn't kind of fit in with the theme of your discussion about having significant relevance today uh, in regard to to Russia. Anyways, that's my question about that. Yeah. Um, well, I mentioned that 27 million uh, Soviets died in World War II. I didn't mention how many Chinese died in World War II. And the most scholars think that about 13 million Chinese died in World War II. But uh, the Chinese Communist Party claims that 35 million Chinese died in World War II. So the Japanese invasion began in 1931, uh, but it really mm. gained steam in 1937. And uh, it was, when people know about the rape of Nanjing, they know about other atrocities that the Japanese committed. The Japanese, initially actually, the Japanese were welcomed as liberators throughout much of the Pacific because they at least were Asians and because people were so fed up with British and French and Dutch uh, colonialism in, in, in uh, the Pacific. So they initially welcomed the Japanese as liberators, but that did not last long. The Japanese wanted to exploit their East Asian co-prosperity sphere, as they called it, their, East, their Asian colonies, and they were very, very brutal. Uh, some of it was famine, and some of it was just uh, Japanese aggression. And uh, in, in Vietnam, for example, between a million and two million people died under Japanese rule. In China, between 13 and 35 million people died. 
but that was not, but the United States did not get involved just because of the atrocities being committed against the Chinese people. The United States got involved in large part because the Japanese were cutting off access to China's trade and resources and labor uh, from, the, from the United States. Uh, the United States, for example, when we got involved in the Boxer Rebellion, the United States had always had this fantasy that uh, about the China market. And uh, this goes back to the 1890s, that somehow the China market was gonna be a salvation to America's overproduction problems. The depression of 1893 was really a depression based on overproduction. And the American leaders had two choices on how to get out of that. Because the American industry was already the world's leading industrial force. Uh, so they were two things you can do. You can deal with that overproduction problem by raising the standard of living of workers in the United States, of workers and farmers in the United States in order to consume the surplus, or you can look for overseas markets. Of course, American capitalists always chose the latter course to find overseas markets. And China was really their fantasy. Uh, so when the Japanese started to cut off access to those economics, that trade and to those markets, the Americans responded. Americans responded with sanctions. And the sanctions, uh, first with materials and metals, uh, but then they got to sanctions on oil. And the Japanese felt that they needed to get oil if they were gonna be able to keep their fight going in China, if they were gonna be able to keep their domination in China. Their main source of oil at this point was the Dutch East Indies or Indonesia. And they thought that the American uh, uh, base at Pearl Harbor could interfere with their access to oil in the Dutch East Indies. And so they decided to attack at Pearl Harbor. The idea was they could wipe out the American fleet in one fell swoop, and then they would have access. Many of the Japanese leaders thought this was a crazy idea. Uh, the first US naval historian to write a lot about this was Samuel Elliott Morrison, who described this, the Japanese strategy as strategic imbecility. He said, one can search military history in vain for an operation more fatal to the aggressor. On the strategic level, it was idiotic. On the high political level, it was disastrous. Uh, the Americans knew an attack was coming. They thought it was going to come in the Dutch East Indies or Malaya, the British colony in Malaya. They did the, some people thought that it could happen at Pearl Harbor. Uh, we knew about when it was coming. We had intelligence to say that, but we did not really think it was coming at Pearl Harbor and we were not prepared. And much of the fleet got destroyed there. Um, but I don't, I don't agree with those who think that uh, Roosevelt deliberately set us up for that attack. Roosevelt had told Churchill uh, that we will fight the war, but we won't declare it. And he has said this months earlier. And the U.S. was involved in the war much earlier than most people believe. And Roosevelt did want to get us involved in the war and did welcome when the opportunity finally came. But, uh, uh, but the reason why the Japanese attacked was because they wanted to make sure they had access to the oil that they desperately needed, especially from the Dutch East Indies after the US created, uh, had an embargo on oil to Japan. Great, thank you. All right, um, any other questions or comments? Okay, Carl Davidson, unmute yourself. <clears throat> There we go. I, th I thanks for that. I thought it was pretty comprehensive, and there's not much I disagreed with in, in it. Um, but my question is: uh, it's 50 years later, or more than 50 years later. Uh, all this happened when I was around the time I was born, 70 years later. <laughs> so, what does it have to do with what what uh, we have to think about going forward? Um, you know, the, you know, the world is radically different. The Soviet, though there's no Soviet Union, the Russia's uh, dominated, his favorite philosopher these days is uh, 
pro-Nazi fascists that Putin has had everybody studying. Uh, China is uh, going to be one of the you know the world's uh, major uh, industrial powerhouses and players. And the U.S. is considerably weaker. Um, the Soviets have about 4,000 nuclear weapons, and so did the U.S., and China only has 200 because they decided that all the rest is kind of useless. They figured they can wipe out the U.S. with 200 or even 100, and then so all the rest is just, you know, macho bluster. They don't really need it. It's a waste of money. Uh, so I'm of the opinion that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people are, are you know, denouncing Biden as a uh, as a Cold Warrior 2.0. Um, I'm not certain about that because I, I think, like you do in a way, that the future is open. Just because it happened that way didn't mean it had to happen that way. And uh, so I think that uh, some of these people around Biden, if they're smart enough, are going to try to figure out something different. Uh, so I'd just like your comments on that. <clears throat> Carl, um, uh... I agree with what you were saying at the end for sure. Uh, I think that it is still undetermined what path Biden will take. Uh, and there are a couple of things that give me a li at least a little bit of hope with Biden. One is that he opposed the troop buildup in Afghanistan when Obama was supporting it and Clinton was supporting it. The second was uh, he says, and I, and, and this is, I don't know the, in, I don't have the documents from the inside, but he says he also opposed the invasion of Libya, the so-called UN action, humanitarian action in Libya that's created a disaster. Uh, and which is also hopeful. My concern is that the people around him, especially Blinken and Sullivan, and then likely Michelle Flournoy, uh, or perhaps Susan Rice, that these people all supported the invasion of Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria. They, support, they support, supported, they were actually devised timber sycamore in Syria at a time when the Syrian civil war was not happening really. Uh, the US flooded Syria with, with arms and um, for the, uh, the Nusra Front and others. Uh, so, so I'm concerned not so much just Biden himself, his instincts. I mean, Biden has, has mostly supported the military and military buildup and, and interventions, uh, but not, not always. So I think he exercises some judgment. Uh, the person who has disavowed that more than anybody that I've seen is Robert Gates former head of the CIA, now security advisor, and Gates opposed Obama's planned bombing in Syria, and was it 2014? And he said, haven't these people learned anything from Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya? Don't they know that these actions have unintended consequences? And, and Gates opposed it. I have not seen that same restraint or insight from Blinken or from uh, Sullivan or Flournoy. Uh, maybe Flournoy won't become Secretary of Defense. I hope she doesn't. But if she does, that's a lot of close advisors who are going to be very, very hawkish and militaristic and, and believe in military solutions. Blinken has said, he wrote something with Bob Kagan in which they said that the problem with Iraq was not the invasion. The problem was our execution afterwards. So, uh, I mean, I don't think, I don't see that they've learned anything. And, and um, so I, I'm not happy that Biden has chosen them. Uh, and I don't know what to make of Biden's own instincts at this point and what he's learned because there was no discussion of nuclear policy or foreign policy in the campaign. Uh, I was hoping there would be, I, I was pushing for it, but it didn't, it didn't happen. So, um, in terms of the other points you're making about the way the world has changed, uh, the, uh, I think that the, I, I see us as facing two main existential threats today. One is the climate threat, uh, global warming, 
and the other is still the nuclear threat. I see the nuclear threat as the short-term, most immediate danger, global warming as the long-term danger. And uh, there have been so many reports of late. We know that the scientific consensus is that anything more than a two degree Celsius increase in global temperatures is gonna be a disaster. We're gonna lose global coastal cities, parts of India, Southern India, China are gonna be uninhabitable. And we know that the islands are gonna go under, it's gonna be a disaster. Many of the leading experts think that if we can limit it to three degrees, we're gonna be lucky and that we're really on course for a four degree increase in global warming. So the first thing, the first reason why I'm so happy to get Trump out of there is because his not only pulling us out of the Paris Climate Accords, but all of his policies, I think are homicidal when it comes to climate change. And Biden is gonna do a lot better on that. Not as much I would like to see, but, I, but it's gonna be much better. And the second is I'm still terrified. Uh, I think that the number of nuclear weapons in the world is still more than 13,000. Uh, and the US and Russia uh, have more than 90% of those weapons and a couple thousand of which are pointed at each other on hair trigger alert. Uh, so one of the, we need to do a few things. One is we need to uh, get, we need to get them off hair trigger alert. First thing we need to do even before that is extend the new START treaty. Uh, so we'll have five more years. We can sign it off on that. That's already a provision of the original treaty. So that is achievable. I don't think we're about to join the UN nuclear ban treaty too quickly, but I'd like to see us do that and uh, we should push for that. So uh, I'm a, I strongly support. I support minimally getting our nuclear arsenal down to the threshold below which nuclear winter can occur. And we haven't mentioned this, but I will take a minute to say this. The latest scientific studies show that what Sagan and the others warned about in the 1980s is actually more dire than they were saying at the time. That the latest scientific studies actually lowered the threshold for nuclear winter below what they were saying in the 1980s. Uh, the latest scientific studies show that a limited nuclear war between India and Pakistan, which 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons were deployed, would create partial nuclear winter, would send up the cities would burn, there'd be 5 million tons of smoke and soot shot up into the stratosphere within two weeks, they'd circle the globe, they would, they would block the sun's rays from reaching the Earth's surface, temperatures would plunge to freezing, and that limited nuclear war between India and Pakistan using 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons could kill up to 2 billion people around the world. What we have now is not 100, it's 13,000, and they're not Hiroshima size, they're between 80 and 80 times the size of the Hiroshima bomb. So, I, so what I wanna do initially is at least deal with the two main existential threats. I don't think we're right, ready to create the kind of world that many of us would like to see, a world with much different kinds of social justice and, uh, and relations, but at least we can try to do something to defuse the immediate threats so that we, that we can have a future in which future generations can achieve what we haven't been able to achieve. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Judith Rosenthal, um, came in by email, asking you to explain uh, a little more fully why you think that uh, Susan Rice would be a bad choice. Um, Want to add anything to what you've already said on that? I, I'm not a big fan of Obama's foreign policies. And Susan Rice was a, main inf a major influence on Obama. Uh, <clears throat> um, he's not George W. Bush, and he's not Donald Trump, Obama, but I don't like his global drone warfare policies I don't like the fact he was bombing seven Muslim countries. I see Obama as a defender of American empire, a somewhat uncritical defender of American empire and an exponent of American exceptionalism. What he said to the American troops 
at Fort Bragg when he when they came back from Iraq, I thought was very, very revealing. He said, uh, you know, you guys are heroes going back to World War II generations. You don't go over there to Iraq for, for oil or resources or economic gain. You go there and you do these things because it's right, because that's what makes us different as, as Americans. We do these things because we're right, because it's right, because we want to spread decency. And this, that's the heart of American exceptionalism, this idea that the United States is not only different from all other countries, but the United States is better than all other countries, that everybody else is motivated by greed or territorial aggrandizement or geopolitical uh, domination. But the US wants to go out in the world because we believe in freedom and democracy and all we want to do is spread liberty or, and justice around the world. And that's so dangerous. And you can trace it back to this, to uh, John Withrop's sermon aboard the Arbella in 1630 in Massachusetts Bay, a city upon a hill. Or you can trace it back to Woodrow Wilson in 1919 when he says, now the world will see America as the savior of the world after World War I in Versailles. <clears throat> but that attitude is so widely held in the United States. And Susan Rice and Obama were leading exponents of that. And so, um, Susan Rice, I haven't seen, I just haven't seen that she has learned from her military, uh, her, her military dependent policies during the Obama years. Uh, I think the US policy, for example, one of the things that we haven't gotten into that I think is very, Carl mentioned about Russia. And, um, and one of the things that I think is very important for understanding Russia's behavior is the expansion of NATO. Gorbachev, who gave Oliver Stone to me our first blurb when, when Untold History came out. Uh, Gorbachev, who I see as one of the good guys in the 20th century and 21st century, uh, said he you know, made very, very clear that the Americans and the Germans and the Brits promised that NATO would not expand one thumb's width to the east, one inch to the east, if he allowed for the unification of Germany back in 1990. And, and NATO has now expanded 13 countries to the east up to Russia's doorstep. And in 2008, when George W. Bush said, we want to expand NATO to Ukraine and Georgia, that's when the US ambassador, William Burns, US ambassador to Moscow, writes a memo back to Washington titled, Niet means Niet. He said, respect some of Russia's red lines. He said, you can't just keep on expanding NATO like this and Georgia and Ukraine are off limits. So what happened with uh, when, uh, and, and then we go to trace this back further, trace it back to Brzezinski's grand chessboard. What Brzezinski writes there and Hadley wrote later uh, uh, was that Russia can never be a major player if, we, if it doesn't have Ukraine. And so if we can dissociate, we can disentangle Ukraine from Russia's orbit, then uh, Russia will be uh, minimized as a player, which was the American strategy going back. When Charles Krauthammer in 1990 says, this is America's unipolar moment. He says, the Soviet Union's over, we can dominate the world, we should not allow anybody to emerge anywhere that can challenge the United States in any part of the globe. That was 1990, he says the unipolar moment might last 30 or 40 years. It was right after that that the, US, that the neocons announced their defense planning guidance, which they had to roll back. But that says basically the same thing, bragging about it. Uh, but then, uh, then the, the project for the New American Century starts and the neocons take over the George W. Bush administration. And in 2002, after the invasion of Afghanistan, Krauthammer writes, I was wrong. This is not the unipolar moment. This is the unipolar era. American <laughs> domination of the world could last for indefinitely. Uh, and, 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 you know, so these people, and, and it's right after that, it was on January 5th, uh, 2003, that the New York Times headlined its Sunday magazine section, American Empire, get used to it. And the neocons came out of the woodwork. They were bragging now that we're an empire. They, were ne they never would have acknowledged that before. Rumsfeld didn't like the idea, but everybody, they were all proud of it, that the American domination would last indefinitely. By 2006, Afghanistan and Iraq was such a disaster that, uh, uh, that Krauthammer writes an obituary for the American empire. You know, and, and, uh, but, but that's the, the, 
world we're living in and Obama basically maintained that. I had great hopes for Obama when he naively, uh, when he first got elected. And, uh, you know, and I think that it was nice to have a very intelligent, articulate president given the ones we had before and, and since. Uh, but, uh, but Obama's policies were very, very disappointing in that regard. And, and Susan Rice was one of his very, very close advisors on, on that. Well, isn't one of the implications of the whole notion of American exceptionalism that it leads to interventionism? And we justify, we're morally entitled to do that. As Madeleine Albright says, if, uh, uh, if we use force, it's because we're America. We're the indispensable nation. We stand taller and see farther into the future than other countries. You know, and they believe that. Obama also said that indispensable nation. You know, what they don't understand is something that even Samuel Huntington of all people understood. Huntington said, the West won the world not by the superiority of its ideas or values or religion. We won the world by superiority of our use of organized violence. He said, Westerners often forget that fact. Non-Westerners never do. So this idea of American exceptionalism, I think, is so corrosive. And we grow up with it. It's at the, for example, uh, you know, I, I watched during the Russia Gate. You turn on MSNBC or CNN, they'll sometimes have a panel with four experts. And they'll all say Russian intervention into the 2016 election in the US was an act of war. And, and not, not a single person will have any perspective about US intervention, US interference in elections, uh, US armed intervention, overthrowing governments, democratically elected popular governments like Mossadegh in Iran in 1953, uh, Guatemala, you know, in Guatemala, I mean, one after another after another. I'm not trying to justify Russian interference. I think it's terrible and we've got to deal with that kind of thing and stop this kind of interfering, but we need perspective. We need historical perspective. We need to understand how the world looks at the United States and what the United, what positive role the United States can play in this world, and it can. Okay, we have two other people who have questions they want to pose. Uh, Joyce Carlson first, and then Martin O'Malley. Joyce? Yeah, I'm not sure if I have a question or comment. Um, well, I'm sitting here in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Can you believe that? <laughs> and it's just been so wonderful. I've been here for um, 45 years or so. And uh, the scientists and all the work here, it's now under the Department of Energy. And uh, the lab has sort of converted in a large part to study of um, energy, climate change, huge issues, the scientific solutions that we can come up with for climate change. Everybody's so invigorated. They were working on all that. And, and then there was a portion of the lab uh, and the scientists uh, concerned with stockpile stewardship, they call it, and dismantling weapons. When we came there, we had 32,000 nuclear weapons, the US did. Now uh, the lab work continued. It was an incredible job in getting all of those weapons disassembled, dismantled, the plutonium stored away. It was a huge job. You wouldn't believe the effort that's gone on. Uh, but now, <laughs> this is scary. And it's interesting to see you and the perspective uh, right out that window. Los Alamos, a very small town, 20,000. And they're building houses like crazy they, where there's not much land. They're smashing them in there and they're hiring people. And it's probably all under something to do with Trump. I don't know what's gonna happen now, but they're, I guess they're developing new weapons. There's a buildup. The only place they can 
even assemble them, manufacture them, and do all the new theory. I don't know what all they're doing, but they're coming to town. And the lab is hiring. The government is hiring them. Anyway, scary perspective, you know, and if I just drive out a couple blocks over to the grocery store, I buy, I go by this new housing district in my little teeny town. They're bringing them here. Okay, Peter, you want to comment on the expansion of Los Alamos? Uh, you might know my friend, Greg Mello, out yeah. of Los Alamos, sure. Uh, he does very, very good work on this. Um, yeah, that Trump and uh, Trump's new nuclear posture review, he announced that the United States is going to develop two new nuclear weapons, uh, which are smaller and more usable. Trump had commented early, he said, what's the point of having nuclear weapons if we can't use them? To Trump, that meant let's use them. I mean, to normal people, it means let's get rid of them. Uh, but now Trump is developing two that he considers to be more usable. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm, and that's part of what's going on. I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I think it's the wrong kind of approach, the wrong kind of policy, and that the US and Russia, Carl mentioned before that China is smart enough to know they only need 200 nuclear weapons in order to have a credible deterrent. Uh, but it's a dangerous situation in the, in the South China Sea with the US running freedom of navigation operations there with our ships. And one of them, the, U, the American and the Chinese warships avoided each other by 45 yards. Uh, we're also running them in the Strait of Taiwan. Uh, so I think we do need to dramatically decrease the number of nuclear weapons. I would love to see it down to zero, uh, but uh, uh, we need to be cutting them, not increasing them. And the US modernization is making the ones we have more accurate and more lethal. So we're, we're not going the right direction and there's no international leadership. I mean, Biden, Trump, Biden. Xi, Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin, Modi, you look at the leaders of these countries and nobody speaks for the planet. Nobody has a global perspective. They're all make America great again, make Russia great again, make China great again, make India great again. You know, and um, that's really not what the world needs right now. If the pandemic has taught us anything, we are one nation, I mean, one global community. We are very closely integrated. Uh, and what happens in one part of the world affects people all over the planet. And we have to begin to see this with more of a species consciousness and a global consciousness uh, rather than the kind of nationalist perspective that all of these elite countries are, are taking, are adopting right now. Plus the other thing we haven't talked about is there's a, a rise of fascism globally. I mean, or right-wing extremism with fascist tendencies. Uh, in much of the world right now. And if we look at the impact that the immigration and the refugees had in parts of Europe, where you've got this rise of these extreme right-wing parties as a result of this, this is nothing compared to what's gonna happen from the global climate change. We're talking about hundreds of millions of refugees over the next decades. And how are we gonna deal with that kind of crisis globally? I mean, if we see the effect that this is having, and this is relatively minimal compared to what we're going to confront in the future, you know, it, it's terrifying. Before we run out of time, I'd like to give Martin O'Malley a chance to pose his question. If you will unmute your mic and turn on your camera so we can see you, Martin. Is that my former governor, Martin O'Malley, here in the <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, my question was that uh, Russia, uh, China, and the United States were allies during World War II. They collaborated with each other. Was the USA limited solely to the nationalist, or did they also provide aid to uh, Mao Zedong and the, uh, and the Chinese? <clears throat> the U.S. 
uh, I'm not sure if we provided aid to Mao. I'm not an expert on, on China during World War II. I know we did provide aid to Ho Chi Minh uh, in Indochina, and he was fighting against the Japanese. Um, uh, I know that Henry Wallace came back and made a very positive report about some things predicting that the China, that given the corruption of, Chiang, of Jiang Jieshi or Chiang Kai-shek, that the that Mao and the, and the communists were likely to triumph in China, and people weren't happy to hear that report. My, my guess is that we were providing aid to Mao, but, um, but I'm not, I, don't, I'm not, I haven't studied that enough to know how much aid we were providing to uh, Mao and, and the communists in China during the war. But we did provide aid to left-wing anti-Japanese and anti-fascist forces during World War II. My uncle was in the army in China, and uh, he informed me that some of our aid did get through to the to the communist side. I don't know how much, but okay, yeah, some of it did. I, I I I think you know from what I've read that I'm sure that there that's true. Well, and, and it was the the communists who were bearing the brunt of the military resistance against the Japanese, yes. not the nationalists. Not the nationalists. Well, Peter, I want to thank you for a very informative and stimulating presentation today. You um, opened a lot of questions, and I, I hope that uh, um, will expand the appreciation of all of our audience for a critical study of history. Um, it is, uh, it's. As I said at the beginning, it's uh, littered with myths that have to be questioned, um, lest uh, a misreading of history leads us into further errors. So thank you again, Peter. We appreciate your, your time. Um, and uh, 